Vader has probably been around almost as long as humans have. I mean, think about it. Everyone has that uncle who sits there and is really dramatic in his telling of what happened while buying bread at the grocery store. But we're not focusing on your uncle. Here we're focusing on theater and specifically understanding theater. What do you need to know so you can better appreciate any kind of play or musical or theatrical experience. Now, theater was at one time the primary form of entertainment. You might go out in the evening and see a street performer. You might go to uh, some kind of body theater, which was quite common throughout the medieval, the Renaissance, and into fairly modern times. Or maybe you went to an upper class theater, maybe an opera. All of these would kind of come from the same world, this world of theater. Now, theater basically relies on drama to compress stories or ideas or concepts into organized episodes. Typically, it's a way of telling a story, although you can have other forms of theater as well, abstract theater, etc. So what they're trying to do is tell a story. But rather than simply telling the story by acting it out, it makes it more interesting. It draws the viewer in. It creates an experience, which is why we use it so commonly when we're trying to teach something of great importance, social mores, social taboos, how to be a functional member of society. This used to be quite common in the West and still is in non-Western traditions. Now, the modern equivalent of theater today, or sorry, before I get into that, we credit the Greeks with the idea of modern theater. In fact, the Greeks did not invent theater, and make sure that you write that in your notes if you're writing notes. The idea of theater actually goes back much, much further, probably to the first time that a couple of guys acted out a story. So, when we talk about the Greeks in theater, they give us the modern idea of theater. This idea of a large cast of characters and the stage setting and how that is all set up. And we go into that elsewhere. But here, it's important to know that while the Greeks contributed a great deal to theater, they did not invent it. Now, modern theater is not as popular today. In fact, today it's really been replaced in many ways by TV and film. Just think about it. Your average TV show is nothing more than theater coming out of a glowing screen. When you sit there and watch Netflix, it's really the same thing. All of the same principles and ideas apply when you look at cinema or television as you see when you look at theater. And for the purpose of this class, I'm frequently going to use examples from television or movie rather than theater since most people are far more familiar with those and I'd rather you have a strong understanding than try and be pretentious enough to demand that you understand certain elements of theater based on some completely arbitrary concept of gatekeeping and what is good art and everything else. So. From there, let's move on and talk about genres. Now, genres, the term genre, actually refers to basically a type of play. And you can use the term genre with literature and many other different forms. And there are different kinds of plays. There are tragedies, comedies, tragic comedies, melodrama, and performance art. I'm going to go through each of them. Now, a tragedy is simply a play with an unhappy ending. Typically, we're going to see some form of tragic hero who makes free choices that bring about suffering, defeat, and triumph as a result of defeat. The protagonist, the person that we're following through the story, generally will undergo some kind of struggle, often ending disastrously. Now, in the Greek tradition, the tragedy will always end poorly. It usually ends with someone's death. There really isn't a tradition where you would see a tragedy end well. I mean, maybe Titanic, the ship needed to sink, otherwise Jack would still be around and that'd be horrific. But, leaving that aside, tragedies always end poorly for the protagonist. Now, we do have this concept of this tragic hero. Typically, someone with traits that earn them some sympathy, but they also have flaws. This would be someone who is 
good in their heart, but they're very egotistical or someone who is on this journey from being a fairly bad person to a fairly good person. We like these kinds of stories because they humanize us. They humanize the character, excuse me, and they allow us to explore elements of the human condition that we may not otherwise see. For example, we can pretend that we're a very short person with furry feet running around with a ring trying to throw it in a volcano. Now, that's an oversimplification, but that's what drama does. And that's basically what we're seeing here. Now, in Greece and Greek drama, we tend to see moral victories with physical defeat. In other words, the person does the right thing, but they die in the process. This is, again, a very common trope that we see throughout drama. Now, another form of genre that we're going to see is going to be comedy. Now, it is argued that comedy is, of course, going to be far more difficult than any other form. Why is that? Well, the thing is, most of us can agree on tragedy. If we see a bunch of children in a sinking boat, we can agree that that's tragic. If we see that people continue to buy kittens when we all know that they're evil, we know that that's tragic. But comedy is a lot trickier. How many of you have gotten yourself into trouble by trying to make a joke that actually didn't work out? It's difficult. Comedy is different, not just between societies, but between people. So, this is going to be a light or amusing subject, uh, a play or piece of theater with a lighter amusing subject, sometimes with a dealing with a serious subject in a light or satirical manner. Now, when we get into comedy, of course, it's more complicated, but when you boil it down in theater, it's basically, if it ends with, and they lived happily ever after, then it probably qualifies as comedy. Did the protagonist, the main character, die? No? Then it's comedy. So it is very complex. The same thing that one person finds hilarious, the next person does not. And comedy will, in fact, disappear for a period of time, only to return in the Middle Ages. Now, it disappears following the fall of Rome, and then it appears a few hundred years later in the Middle Ages basically is a story with a happy ending. Although you do see illustrations like this. Yes, this is real. I just needed something to illustrate comedy and the Middle Ages and butt trumpets tend to do it. Now, there are different kinds of comedies. There is the comedy of character, which is basically focusing on one individual. Faulty Towers, Black Adder, Mr. Bean. You can tell I watch British comedies. These would all be comedies of character, where we're following this one person and their adventures through their life based on whatever characteristics that character happens to have. Next, we have comedy of manners. This is usually satirizing a social group, oftentimes the upper class, sometimes society overall. This would be Seinfeld, for example, where they're constantly picking on, why do people do this? Or The Simpsons is really good for this, where it's, again, sort of picking on why do people do these very specific things. Then, and way too many of us are familiar with this, there's romantic comedy, which is basically boring. But if you leave that aside, it's focused on lighthearted, humorous plot lines. It's basically watch Hugh Grant get the girl or whomever else. And it's all about this lightheartedness. You know it's going to happen. It's incredibly predictable. But you know that it's going to be something that is going to be light. It's not going to require you to really think about things. It's not going to require you to delve into serious situations. Of course, it's got its own formulas. And... Yeah, it's problematic, but we will move on from there. Let's talk about comedy of intrigue. This is where we will see intricate plots of reversal with artificial situations. So basically what you're seeing is dramatic action is prioritized over the development of character. We see uh, complicated stratagems and conspiracies. We see odd farcical humor and contrived ridiculous dramatic situations 
often being employed. This would be sketch comedy uh, a lot of times, or at least in the modern form. If you watch Mitchell and Webb, they do uh, comedy of intrigue. Some, to some degree, uh, if you're familiar with Monty Python, uh, they do some of this as well, where they're not worried about the development, they're worried about the setting and what's actually happening. And it tends to be very, very intricate uh, whenever you're dealing with comedy of intrigue. And then sentimental comedy, of course, is the exploitation of potentially serious issues without approaching the tragic aspects of it. So, this is something where there's some serious aspect. Think about uh, Pretty Woman, for example. This movie with Richard Gere and Julie Roberts, and Julie Roberts is a prostitute, and Richard Gere pays her a lot of money to stay with him for a week, and then they fall in love. And they're dealing with this relationship, this happy ending that we know is going to happen. They're going to fall in love. But they totally miss or go around the more serious aspect, which in this case would be prostitution. And whether he's taken advantage and is this appropriate and can she consent and all of these different issues that can go into it. We see the same thing in movies like Pride and Prejudice or books like Pride and Prejudice where we're dealing with one thing, but in the background there's really a serious issue that we're trying to go around. Uh, you know, we're, we're introducing it, but we're not trying to focus on it 100%. And of course, there are other examples of Pride and Prejudice as well that are possibly more exciting. Then there's tragic comedy. This is basically reversals. Uh, tragedy moving to a comedy, comedy moving to a tragedy, and flipping back and forth. You could argue that Romeo and Juliet would be a great example of this because, of course, you have the positive, they fall in love, the negative, uh, where Romeo gets into all kinds of trouble, the positive, where they end up married, the negative, where they end up killing each other or killing themselves. It's back and forth. So you could argue that, for example, would be tragic comedy because of those reversals back and forth. So we're beyond uh, looking at comedies now. Then we have melodrama. And this uses stereotypical characters involved in a series of situations in which suspense, pathos, terror, and occasionally hatred are going to be aroused. This is your classic, the bad guys wearing black, the good guys wearing white, uh, all of these kinds of ideas. Good will almost always triumph. And... Here, generally the forces are going, the forces working against the main character are going to be external. The main character is not growing. He's focusing on this external world. He plays the same stagnant role throughout the entire drama. And these dramas, these melodramas, will often rely on special effects because the story is incredibly predictable. This is good because... Well, special effects are really interesting, but the special effects will also tax the theater space because you have to find a way to make it happen. So melodrama, while predictable, it can be comforting. We know what's coming. On the other side, it is boring for a lot of people. Then we have performance art. And here we see an art form that combines elements of visual art and dramatic performance. This is very common uh, these days, and it's become more and more common since about the 1960s. And it pushes the limits of traditional theater, sometimes denying the traditional concepts of theatrical production itself. And there's no such thing as a typical performance art piece. They're all very, very different. It has seen difficult times recently, though, as it has been viewed as rebellious and controversial for its own sake, for the sake of being controversial. You have people doing what many people would think are crazy things. You have people trying to get across ideas that are very difficult to get across and doing so through performance art. You can even see protest in the form of performance art. So it's a, it's a strange world where it crosses over between visual art and theater, but we don't have a really good definition. It's one of those areas where you look at it and you can kind of say, yeah, that's it. I know it if I see it, if that makes sense. So, from there, let's talk about the production. So, the production itself, the theatrical production, consists of a script, a plot, 
a character, a protagonist, themes, and visual elements. You can't have theater without those. So let's start at the beginning. We have a script. Now this is a written document containing the dialogue used by our actors. And the way it's written will tell us a great deal about whatever we're going to be viewing. For example, if you go to a play and you hear everyday language, what might be called the common vernacular, we can expect that it's looking at some kind of everyday common truth, something that we all come across, something that you know it's not trying to be particularly pretentious about. On the other side, if you hear poetic language, this will often indicate strong symbolism. Now, that being said, you know, poetic language tends to be symbolic, tends to be abstract. Everyday language tends to be ground down to earth. But if you're reading something by Shakespeare or from a period, you know, 500 years ago, the language was different and oftentimes sounds far more poetic to us than it would have to the person listening at the time. So always keep that in mind, the context or at least the age of when a play was written. You'll also see in a script monologues known as soliloquies, which give us a character's inner thoughts. Then we have the plot. This is the structure or skeleton of the play. The dynamics of the play will rise in intensity until they reach a climax and then relax into the resolution and the end of the story. Now, let's talk about the elements of the plot, but before we get there, let's talk about why it has to exist. I'm going to pull out my handy dandy pen to do so. So, when you come into the theater, you will be here. This is sort of your emotional baseline. When you're looking at a plot diagram, think of it as diagramming emotion more than diagramming the play. And it's the viewer's emotion, not the character's. And what you're going to do is you're going to go through you know, a basic introduction, and then you're going to go through this rising action. I'm going to get into all of this more in a few minutes. Then you get to that climactic point, that point in the story where everything starts to resolve and then you see that falling action. Now, you'll notice that most of the time when you come into the play at the exposition and you finish the play, show, movie, whatever, at the resolution, they should be at more or less the same level. Why? Because it's really awkward as humans to have an emotion that we can't attach something to. Imagine if you walk into a theater and you're, you know, very calm or in a very pleasant place and then you watch a movie and you walk out and you're just incredibly angry. Now, if I, it's a documentary about uh, the mistreatment of whales, for example, yeah, that might be what I'm aiming for. But if it's watching, you know, the latest Star Wars, that's probably not a great thing. We want to walk into the theater and out of the theater at the same level, not angrier or sadder or whatnot. So it's important that that exposition and the resolution are kind of at the same level, unless I'm trying to push you in a specific direction, which we aren't going to see that much of here, but it does in fact happen. So let's start with the exposition. Now the exposition basically gives us background information. This is what we need when we come into the story. Oftentimes, you're going to see, you know, flying through a city or someone talking about in a world or you're going to have people introducing themselves with flashbacks and everything else or it's the DCU and it's just not going to work well at all from any level. But it basically introduces the characters, gives us their personalities, relationships, background and situation because, of course, every story has to have these things and if we went through and tried to start from the beginning and introduce all of this dramatically, it could make for a very, very long play. And humans have very limited attention span. So the exposition will depend on where the playwright decides to take up the story known as the point of attack, the point where they start that. And in some cases, this exposition can actually be, for example, in Star Wars, these uh, cards that you're reading that give you the background information so that they can kick right into the action. So there's a lot of possibilities here. Then you have the complication. Now the complication is a single event that starts the conflict. It ends the exposition and really gets the story rolling. 
Now, preferably, that conflict is going to happen fairly early on, although in some cases, you can be 45 minutes into a show before having actually gotten to the conflict, and usually, the happy medium is somewhere in the middle between zero and, you know, 45 minutes. So, there's a specific moment in the action where a an action or a decision will upset the state of affairs. It's the inciting incident. And this opens the complication. Now, the complication is the meat of the play. It's often referred to as the rising action. And it looks like a nice, flat, straight line. But in fact, it usually plays out a little more like this. So, it's comprised of a series of conflicts or decisions called crises. And these will build up. But, of course, the human, any human, can't just hold at that really high level of anxiety. We can't stay up here all the time. It just gets very uncomfortable at an emotional level. So, generally what you see is the playwright, the author, etc. will put in slower periods so that they can work us up in this series of steps all the way up to the climax, which is the point of highest tension and drama. This is where the action starts. This is when the solution is given. This is where the massive battle takes place. And this is usually what we're looking forward to. It could be right at the end of a piece. It could be right in the middle. In some cases, you actually will have the climax almost halfway through a play and then another hour bringing down everything, giving us the falling action. So, a lot of different ways that these can be plotted out, that these can be worked with. Then we have the resolution and sort of the end. This is the final resolution of the plot. Now, here we're seeing the various strands of the plot being drawn together. Matters are explained or resolved. And you're trying to figure out, okay, why did so-and-so do this, you know, 20 minutes in and I still haven't gotten an answer. That's what we're going to see here. So, there is actually a difference between a resolution, and I'm going to butcher this, but a denouement. A resolution is the part of the story where a character solves the main problem. This is really the end of the climax. The uh, other part, the denouement is what happens at the very end of the story. So this is tying up all the other loose ends. What happens to the bad guy? What happens to his ship? What happens to X, Y, and Z? So there's a lot that goes into it. So let's talk about some of the other plot elements that you're likely to come across. For example, foreshadowing, which is some kind of warning or indication. Now, why do we need foreshadowing? Well, it gives credibility, first of all, for some future action. It keeps the plot logical and avoids confusion. We as humans do not like surprises. All of those humans that like surprises were generally eaten by the surprise of a saber-toothed tiger at some point 100,000 years ago. So we like predictability. That's why we like pop music. That's why we like certain things. What foreshadowing does is it gives us an element of predictability. It also makes you feel really smart because you're going to pick up on it and you're going to go, hey, I bet that there was that clue and I bet, hey, I bet that guy did it. Sort of like if you're ever watching CSI or SVU or any other crime drama, it's always the second guy they interview who did it, but they never actually look that way. They always rule him out or he's standing right next to the first guy, whatever it is. But we tend to like foreshadowing. Then we have discovery. This is a revelation of information about characters, their personalities, their relationships, and their feelings. And this is going to be particularly important because oftentimes we're going into the dramatic piece and we don't know a lot of information. We don't know why this character does what he does. And so when you see her discovery, you're going to see some element. Sometimes it's a flashback giving us an element of her childhood or his days at summer camp or whatever it is, it's going to be particularly important and it's going to suddenly reveal something particularly important to us.
we will also see reversal, which is any turn of fortune. In other words, suddenly things go from good to bad, or they could go from bad to good. Although we don't see bad to good as often until we get to the climax, typically. Now, we also have to deal with character. This is not the person. This is the psychological motivation of the person in the play. So, if we have someone playing Abraham Lincoln, that actor is not trying to just be Abraham Lincoln. He's trying to bring the psychological motivation. He's trying to mentally be Lincoln. There's a difference there. It's not just looking the part, it's thinking the part. Because that's what's drawing us in. That idea of almost having a three-dimensional simulation of what it would be like to be Lincoln happening on stage in front of us. The audience should focus on the character's motivations, how they change, how they interact with others. Most or much of the interest created by drama lies in how people with specific characteristics react to different situations. For example, a doctor that is constantly taking Vicodin, what's he going to do when faced with patient X? Or, you know, if we have a group of people who are constantly singing and dancing their way through high school, what's going to happen when X happens? And that's really what draws us into these pieces in the first place. Again, they're basically simulations of elements of the human condition that we would never otherwise experience. Then, of course, when we talk about character, we have to talk about the protagonist. This is typically the person that we are following through the play or through the drama. This is the central character. So that could be a good character, it could be an evil character, it doesn't matter. You can actually have multiple protagonists as well. And you'll see this sometimes in uh, more serious drama or literature that's been turned into theater. Because it's easier on a literary level, since you have more time to work with in a book, to have someone follow multiple characters all the way through the story. Now, you can actually have two protagonists and this is actually really really common and by the way the opposite of the protagonist the bad guy is generally the antagonist but uh, we'll deal with that later but you can have what's known as a foil this is a character who appears to accentuate or contrast qualities of the protagonist and so for example if you have Sherlock who is highly logical who is barely human, with no emotion. You would have a Watson who is the opposite, who is very empathetic, very emotional. When you have you know, Harry Potter, who seems very good, you have Draco, who seems very bad. And those characteristics are going to be opposite, or Batman versus the Joker, which is the ordered world, civilization versus chaos, etc., this is going to be really important because it gives us a lot of information. Oftentimes, you're not specifically looking at the character in the foil, but you're looking at what the foil is trying to highlight in the character because that's probably something that the author or the playwright is trying to accentuate. Then we have themes. These are the underlying broad ideas that the author is trying to get across. So at the top, the basic principle is, or the basic piece of any drama is going to be the plot, the story, this is the part you can summarize pretty easily in a book report or review. Then there's the story. This is where we start getting into the conflicts and tearing apart why these characters are doing what they do. The theme, at the end of the day, is that overarching idea behind the plot. So, for example, the overarching idea of, say, Romeo and Juliet could be that grudges are unnecessary, that teenagers shouldn't be allowed near poison. It's going to always be something broader. So always look for that broad, abstract theme. In Hamilton, you might talk about, there's actually multiple themes there, but you could talk about immigration. You could talk about legacy. And so you see it's usually an abstract concept that's sitting below every other element in the piece. Now, there are also visual elements. The director, of course, shapes the playwright's language, plot, and characters. They will also, 
translate them into action by using spectacle or mise-en-scene or visual elements. And visual elements include the psychological relationship between the actor and the audience. So, when we are looking at plays or TV, theater, uh, cinema, what you have is a couple of different people. You have the playwright creating that script, but the playwright is just creating the story. Translating that into a visual form, that's going to be the job of the director. And it doesn't matter, whether, again, whether it's movie, television, or theater, that director always plays the same role. And so they're focused on the visual elements, how they are going to present that information to get across the theme of the story, all of those different levels. It's one thing to understand the plot. It's wholly another to really understand the theme behind it. Now, there are different kinds of theaters that we use for different purposes. Our response to a production is in part shaped by the design of the theater space. After all, it plays into how we experience the piece, whether we feel particularly close to the characters or far away, how safe we feel releasing our emotions or revealing ourselves within that space. So the earliest or most natural arrangement is going to be theater in the round. This is the basic form. Now, this is actually a Roman amphitheater, but it's the same basic principle. You have people in the middle acting, and they're going to spin around so that the audience can really find out what's going on. This tends to be the most intimate kind of theatrical experience. Now, the downside of theater in the round is someone is always looking at their at the actors backs so you're not always sitting there with a connection to the actor and that can make it very difficult because it's sort of like you have a connection and then you don't as they spin around as they move now another form is going to be the thrust theater and this is also known as a three quarters theater here we have an audience on three sides. Now, the positive is most of the audience is going to see what's going on most of the time. The downside is, of course, as you move into these seats on either side, closest to the back wall here, the side wall, what you're going to end up with is people who are constantly looking at the actor's backs. They're not going to have the connection. They're not going to have the same experience as they would otherwise. So there's always positives and negatives. The most common form that we see today is going to be called the proscenium theater. This is your typical theater where you have the stage up front, seats out uh, beyond, and it's called the proscenium theater because this area here that comes up and around is known as a proscenium arch. And that separates or frames the stage from the audience. It gives us some space so that we feel safe enough to explore our emotions and allow that play or that piece, whatever it is, to take us on this larger emotional journey known as the plot model. But we need some distance to do that. Now, there are other uh, various experimental forms where maybe you go through a warehouse and you're talking to the actors up front and you can go digging through the various stage settings that are set up for you. But they've discovered that these are sometimes problematic. You need a certain amount of separation for certain kinds of emotional responses. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're going through a haunted house. Now, in a haunted house, if it worked, you would be screaming and terrified and everything else, but it doesn't. And the reason is, oftentimes you're too close, your guard is up. And so you're not going to allow yourself certain emotions, instead you're going to constantly remind yourself that these are actors, they can't touch you, whatever the situation is. So, we need to have a certain amount of separation to give us that ability to have true emotional responses, the sort of thing that is going to draw us into a piece of theater. We tend to see this uh, in proscenium theaters and elsewhere, although it can get too far as well. And this is known as the aesthetic distance. In other words, how 
close or how far we are from the action and how that how much that allows us to experience the emotions that the director is trying to communicate. Then we have scene design. Now this creates an environment suitable for achieving the aims of the production. If it's a very realistic scene, then it's going to give us the idea that everything is very realistic. If it's not, then we might be in sort of a dreamland or an abstract universe. It's all told to us through scene design. And it uses the same compositional ideas as painters, but they have to take actors, of course, into account because things move in theater, unlike painting, where typically it doesn't move unless it's falling off the wall, in which case that's a bit of an issue. They will also use lighting design. Now here, there's a bunch of different ideas. First of all, they're trying to make sure you can see the actor and provide mood through color. For example, blue light might give us the idea of night, but also maybe sadness, uh, any number of different things. They will also try and sculpt light and shadow because oftentimes, if you're in the back of the audience, if you're 100 feet away, you're not just looking at the character, but your brain is also taking into account the shadow that they're casting and using that to fill in some of the blanks when you can't see exactly what their hand is doing. So it's giving you additional information that's going to be very, very important for the people in the back. The human form also needs some shadows to be seen from a distance because the human form is kind of tricky. Other than arms and legs, everything else is very small and hard to see. So we see different functions. We see selective visibility, the idea of the spotlight. I only want you looking at this, not at that. Or the idea of rhythm and structure, which is indicating a rise or fall in the action telling us where we should be in that emotional journey can also set mood as we talked about or create illusion or give us some idea of motivation so lighting can do a great deal in theater then we have costume design now this is the design of the hair the clothing the makeup everything to suit the person and the location now, the tricky part is it must be visible from 100 feet or so, wherever the back of the theater is. And some theaters are massive, so it becomes very difficult. Oftentimes, when you see these actors or actresses up close, you'll notice that the makeup is very gaudy, and that's why, because it needs to be visible. But the importance here is that the costume will reveal the character, their social position, their profession. For example, if they're wearing a tweed coat or a white lab coat, that tells us what they might do. Their cleanliness, which might be important to the story. Their age, which is definitely going to be important. And of course, that can be played with. You can have people uh, artificially aged. It's going to talk to us about their physique and their health, which for certain stories may be important. So if they're showing it to you through the costume, not just through the actual physical costume, but the character that they're choosing, the person that they're choosing to play it, oftentimes that's going to be just as important. So the idea that in Hamilton they chose a specific person for a specific role is going to be very important, and it is the sort of thing that you would want to try and read into. Then we have props. Now props can be hand props or set props. Hand props is anything that the actor is actually holding and it helps portray the character set props are part of the scene design so here the mushrooms are the set props and then if she were holding say a mirror that would be a hand prop we also have to deal with oral elements this is the music and sound effects that contribute to our understanding of any theatrical event any form of drama and you'll notice that pretty much every show that you watch, every movie that you watch, if you were to be able to mute out all of the spoken dialogue, there's almost a continuous soundtrack in the background. Now, what that does is it carries you on that emotional journey. It can make you feel more tense. It can make you feel more relaxed, depending on how that music is going to be chosen. And of course, we see this in movies as well. So it's a very common element 
that we see just trying to help draw us one more tool drawing us along that plot model that emotional roller coaster that we're trying to experience when we see a theatrical event we also have dynamics which is the peaks and valleys that a plot must maintain in order to hold the audience's attention over a span of as much as two hours see the thing is humans have very limited attention span and despite what any teacher has told you it's about 20 minutes that's roughly what the studies tell us and that means that things have to move faster than that you are not really to blame if you sit there after an hour and go wow is he still talking about theater I am and it's perfectly fine so they deal with that in drama by creating these individual elements in our rising action you don't generally see it in the falling action but in the rising action you will see a series of conflicts a series of peaks and valleys that are used specifically to allow us to relax and tense to move through those emotions but also so that we're focused on for example one piece of the story and then we're given a whole different bit of the story as if they're turning the page or giving us different stimulation so these are always carefully controlled then we have actors now the actor is the channel of communication between the playwright and the audience they have one job which is to translate that character from paper into the three-dimensional real world as it were their single basic motivation is going to be known as the super objective and this is what they must translate into physical action so if someone is an eccentric how do you play that out if someone is ill how do you play that out how do you get those ideas laid out by the playwright and communicate them to the audience in such a way that they are experiencing it rather than being told it it's one thing to be you know told hey so and so is rich it's another thing to see Scrooge McDuck actually diving through a vault full of gold which by the way you shouldn't do it's probably quite painful so lifelikeness is going to be important as well here the realism of the set and the details can set the amount of suspended reality required for the audience in a realistic set like this we know that for example the laws of physics are going to continue to function they're not likely to just float up into space it tells us that this is happening in the real world that maybe they're dealing with concepts and ideas a theme that is going to speak to everyone on the other hand something like this is going to tell us that well we're going to be suspending reality our for a period of time we're not going to worry about things like the laws of physics we're not going to worry about reality as such instead we're just going to let ourselves go with the story but we need to be prepared for that and that's why lifelikeness becomes so important set designers will also reflect themselves through palette and design choices especially when we're looking at this element of lifelikeness because you've all seen it you've all seen a set where it should be okay but it's awkward and they run into that danger of falling into the uncanny valley of lifelikeness where it's close but it's not quite there it's 95 percent of the way there it's 96 percent of the way there and it's awkward because obviously there's something off and we keep focusing on it so just one of those things to keep in mind frequently you will find a set that will be a little more artificial simply because it stays away from that uh, uncanny valley and plays better for the drama now in terms of sense stimuli theater of course uh, seeks to speak to us in as many ways as possible and using as many senses as possible because the more senses that we use to understand something the better we're going to understand it the bigger the impact is going to be now obviously sound is going to be key to theater and that's the story being told that's the dialogue that's the music visual pretty straightforward 
again, it could be anything from lighting to watching the characters to seeing special effects, which sometimes you do. But then we do try and play with other things. For example, smell. In some theme parks, such as Disney, you will see 4D theaters where they pump different scents into the theater to try and give you an idea of what's going on to really expand on the experience. Now, if you're watching, for example, Julia Child cooking a beautiful roast chicken, that's fantastic. I'd absolutely want to smell that. If you're watching Rocky IV, mm, eh, maybe not. They will also try and play with the sense of feel. And this is coming in here and there. You're getting chairs in different theaters that have vibration. Some of them have motion experiences now where it's sort of like a simulator uh, running through. And that's becoming more and more common. So it's another thing that we kind of add to the experience. Now, the sense that we really don't have yet is, of course, taste because, well, dinner theater is one thing, but the Rocky IV example gets really awkward. I'm just going to say it now. So that's basically theater, a form of art that exists to help us explore elements of the human condition that we wouldn't otherwise, well, experience. It acts as a simulation. It gives us enough material that we can really see ourselves in these different roles. Maybe seeing yourself as a doctor when, in fact, you're a teacher. And it gives you an idea of how the world works. It gives you a way to explore not only the world out there, but also your inner world, your inner psyche. 